you for, for uh, tuning in uh, to this presentation. Hope you enjoy it. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, please use the chat. Uh, yesterday we had a, a, a pretty lively audience, a lot of great questions, uh, some, most of which I can probably give you an answer, some of which I may not be able to, and that's okay. Um, today we're going to work on a forensic science uh, STEM lesson, and uh, it's part of our series from, from the STEM Behind Hollywood, which is a program we released about, oh, I'd say about five years ago. And, and uh, so TI, most people know TI because of the calculators, and, and, and that's fine, but uh, we actually represent the smallest division of TI. Um, we're tiny. Uh, most of the business that TI does is around semiconductor uh, chips, analog processing chips. So every cell phone in the country, uh, just about every television, um, every automobile probably has at least one TI chip in its computer systems. Um, it's, uh, TI is a, a very, very big company internationally. And uh, like I said, most of the business is not from the calculators at all. We're, we're small. Um, it's from the, uh, the chips. And so uh, if you have like any kind of um, tablets, uh, an iPhone, Samsung, doesn't really matter. Chances are if you crack that open, and I, and I don't suggest you do, uh, but if you were to crack it open, uh, you could probably find a little chip in there with the TI logo on it. So um, well, TI is very interested in, in helping students learn about STEM careers because obviously uh, to make these chips, you need computer programmers, we need engineers, we need mechanical, chemical, electrical engineers to help um, develop this technology. Uh, but it's, it's, more, it's, it's, it's broader than that. Um, we need STEM careers in every field. It doesn't matter what it is. Medicine, especially in medicine. Um, and one aspect of medicine you may not think about is uh, forensic science. And so um, if, a, uh, if there's been a victim of, of a, you know, a crime or, or just an accidental death, we need a medical professional to try to help us figure out what's going on there. Like what happened? How did that person you know, pass away? And so today we're going to explore an activity um, and we're going to look at a career called forensic anthropology. It's a very specialized career. Um, there are only about 100 licensed forensic anthropologists in the world, uh, which is very interesting. And I'm going to introduce you to, um, to one of them today. Uh, she's not live with us, but I'm going to introduce you to her, uh, her sort of biography. Her name is Dr. Diane France and a really neat, really neat forensic anthropologist, and she helped us develop this activity today, so hopefully you'll, you'll uh, enjoy it. Uh, just a quick, they've asked me to give you a little background of myself. Um, I'm not a forensic anthropologist. <laughs> uh, I'm a former high school uh, science teacher. I taught physics and, and biology, biotechnology, um, a little bit of engineering research, um, you know, and then after I taught, I taught for a number of years in Florida. Um, worked at a scientific supply company where we made these cool devices like hovercrafts that you can use with a leaf blower and these Van de Graaff generators where when you put your hands on these dome your hair stands up because of the uh, electrostatics. Um, I've been with TI for about 14 years helping to write activities like you're going to see today working with teachers and students and, and uh, trying to bring more science math and STEM um, you know to, to the classroom. Uh, because honestly, you can get it. You you can you should always follow your dream and get a career um, that that excites you. Uh, and um, you know this is one of those kinds of careers that I think may appeal to some of you uh, in in a sort of morbid kind of way. And we'll get into that shortly. Uh, my background is I, um, I have a master's degree in biotechnology and molecular genetics. I did uh, I did a graduate level research um, in Ohio. For, uh, for a number of years looking at uh, RNA, um, you know, of, uh, of the Y chromosome, um, worked with rats, they're pretty gross, uh, and looked at their, D their DNA and their RNA to try to figure out, uh, you know, different genes that may be responsible for a high blood pressure. As we get older, a lot of us, um, our blood pressure increases and we're trying to figure out why. There's no known cause, there are certainly risk factors, but we don't know what the actual cause of it is. And so my research was trying to uh, figure that out. Prior to that, I got a couple of bachelor's degrees at uh, University of South Florida down in Tampa, Florida, um, one in biology and then one in secondary science education. So learning to be you know, a secondary high school teacher 
and I could also teach middle school as well, although I have never taught middle school. Um, so, so that's a little bit about me. Uh, let's go ahead and jump into the activity. If you guys have any questions about TI, STEM careers, um, biotechnology, forensic science, uh, feel free to ask them. Like I said, if, if I know the answers, I'll definitely share it with you. If I don't know the answers, but I know how to find it, I'll share that with you as well. Um, all right, so STEM Behind Hollywood, this, act, this uh, program was created about five years ago in partnership with the National Academy of Sciences. If you ever get a chance to go to Washington, D.C., <clears throat> and you're going uh, to explore all the, the monuments and things um, that most people do when they're there, um, you may come across a big statue of Albert Einstein sitting kind of cross-legged. I mean, this thing's massive. It's a big statue. Um, he sits out in front of the, the building uh, that is the National Academy of Sciences. And so um, you can go sit in Albert Einstein's lap, get your picture taken. Um, you know, it's only slightly creepy, but uh, kind of cool. And so um, inside that building, uh, so they've got a long history of uh, using scientists, uh, breakthroughs, engineering breakthroughs, medical breakthroughs, and then sharing those with the U.S. government uh, to inform the U.S. government of what's possible, what's next. Uh, the person that started the National Academies was a president. It was a very famous president. It was uh, Abraham Lincoln in 1863. Um, There's a pretty bloody conflict going on in our country at that time, the, uh, the Civil War, and uh, Abe Lincoln was, um, <clears throat> was at the center of that. And he uh, started the National Academies as an independent, non-governmental funded agency to inform the government independently so they don't have to worry about any political bias of you know, hey, here's what's, here's what's available. Here's the breakthrough that we have. Well, those scientists, um, uh, you know, it's a big honor to be part of the academy. And the academy also recognizes that times kind of change. And because Hollywood and television um, movies uh, are very popular with our culture, um, they created this little subdivision called the Science and Entertainment Exchange. The exchange is basically responsible for loaning scientists, engineers, and, and doctors, medical professionals to Hollywood. Uh, so they help bring a little more plausibility to the science that they're portraying. So the example I always like to give is the movie Thor, um, uh, you know, uh, a Marvel movie. And the original Thor, um, they had Natalie Portman's character, which originally she was a, a nurse in the script. The Academy, the exchange came in and said, hey, let's not make her a nurse. Let's make her a... Uh, an astrophysicist to help explain sort of the rainbow bridge between Thor's homeland and, and Earth. And uh, they did that through, uh, you know, wormholes, uh, which are, um, you know, sort of like continuous black holes in a way. So, so that's the kind of stuff they do. They, they help inform Hollywood. We worked with them to create uh, several activities around zombies, which are a lot of fun, uh, ghosts, cryptography. So think like uh, National Treasure, or Indiana Jones type things. There's a really cool math activity around cryptography. Uh, forensics, obviously, superheroes, and um, space. And so uh, today we're gonna look at forensics. And um, um, we've got a couple of activities in here. We're gonna focus in on this one today called Body of Evidence. And uh, the, <clears throat> the person responsible for, uh, for this particular activity, her name is Dr. Diane France. And uh, Dr. France is a, um, uh, PhD. Uh, she runs the Human Identification Lab of Colorado. She teaches uh, um, in Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, she teaches new forensic science college students. And so she is a very influential person in the forensic anthropology field. Okay. All right. Any questions so far before we jump into uh, the activity? And like I said, use that chat window and Edgar will prompt me when there's a, when there's a question. All right, cool. Nothing yet, Edgar? Nothing yet. Cool, all right, no problem. Okay, so here we go. Uh, all of the STEM Behind Hollywood activities do two things. Well, three things, really. They make sure, we make sure that the science or the math that we're trying to convey is covered in detail and in context. Um, the second thing is we, we introduce STEM careers that you may not have been aware of. I mean, how many people have ever heard of a forensic anthropologist before? Probably not many. Um, and then another thing we do is we try to bring in these kinds of um, um, scenarios, these Hollywood-inspired kind of crime drama um, 
uh, scenarios to bring some context to uh, the, the career as well as the science and the mathematics. And so you'll see that here today. Uh, in this particular activity, it's very important to pay attention to what's on the page. There are clues throughout every single page, clues that are going to help you solve this case. Okay. And here's the gist. So breaking news alerts. Uh, local police have been informed that a body of a male victim has been discovered in an open field just outside the city limits. The decomposing corpse appears to be between the ages of 30 and 50. Missing persons reports have helped narrow the identity to four individuals who meet the description of the victim. Any help by local citizens will be appreciated to help solve this case. So they find a, they find a dead body in a field. Uh, it's male. They figure out that uh, the age is probably somewhere between 30 and 50 years of age. And they have these missing persons reports, which is usually one of the first places the police will go to try to identify, okay, who could this body possibly belong to? And what's really interesting is with forensic science work, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the activity, a lot of the effort is not spent on trying to figure out who it is first. It's, try, it's actually the first thing they do is try to figure out who it isn't. And so by saying it's between the ages of 30 and 50 years old, it's a male. Well, we just, it, you know, the fact that it's a male, well, we've ruled out half of the population. 30 to 50 years of age, well, we've ruled out, you know, anybody younger than that or older than that. And so it's sort of uh, getting rid of all of these other uh, possibilities and narrowing in on um, a possible uh, identity of a victim. All right, so you're in your living room. You, uh, the news alert grabs your attention. You're a forensic anthropologist. And so this is, this is how you spell forensic anthropologist. And you may have heard the term anthropologist before. Basically, an anthropologist is a person who studies the remains, um, human remains, of uh, civilizations, and they they try to figure out what you know what were the what were the habits, what were the hunting habits, what how long were these people in existence? Um, they're more historians using human remains as a, a way to kind of piece together uh, a, a story about those that civilization. The difference here is we're a forensic anthropologist, so same idea. I'm using bones and human remains to try to tell a story of if there was a crime committed or an accident, what happened? How did this person die? So, um, you know, so forensic anthropology is a, is a specialized field of the broader field of anthropology. Really cool stuff. Okay, so, uh, so you get a call, um, you've got to, they need you there. So you arrive at the scene, you notice the victim's decomposing with some of the skeletons still visible or actually visible. Um, police and a forensic pathologist are present. So we've got some other careers here, uh, you know, obviously uh, uh, police as a career and also forensic pathology as a career. So a pathologist is someone who tries to determine cause of death. That's their very specific goal. A pathologist, what killed this person? Uh, how did they die? A forensic anthropologist helps the forensic pathologist. So if, if uh, you don't find the remains until, uh, you know, a month, two months down the road, well, the pathologist probably isn't going to have a lot of information they can pull from, but the anthropologist is going to be able to look at those remains and try to help piece together a picture. So sweat forms on your brow. It's been warm and humid all summer. The body has a strong odor. If you ever smell like roadkill, like, um, you know, if there's been a, uh, a raccoon or a um, uh, possum or an armadillo crossing the road, they get hit by the car, they're out there for a few days and you smell something really stinky. It's, it's, um, it's the odor of, that, that gets produced from a dead body. The chemicals called toxin. It's gross. <laughs> uh, maggots are all over the corpse. Uh, there's still a large amount of flesh remaining. You and the forensic pathologist begin examining the body. Okay? I'm going to pause here for just a moment. And I want you guys to participate in the chat. Go ahead and throw some ideas down. Um, what, what's the important, what are the important parts of, of these two pages? If you're a scientist and you're trying to figure out cause of death or how long has that body been there, what's the important parts of these, uh, these two pages here? So this first page, uh, there's some text you can read through. And I'll flip back between these two pages here for you. And I included the question in the chat, so. Awesome. Please feel free to answer them, answer yep. it. 
and I'll, I'll come back to those. Edgar, if you get some answers, um, let me know and we'll jump back over there, okay? Perfect. All right. All right, so I'll keep rolling here. Uh, page four, the forensic pathologist finds trauma to the head. You're examining the exposed skeletal areas for any clues. You also call a coworker who is a forensic entomologist to help identify the species of maggots currently on the victim. You each have specialty areas that will help in identifying this victim. So an entomologist is a person that studies bugs. They're an insect uh, person. They, they're, they're, they know all aspects of, of insects. A forensic entomologist is one that says, okay, the larval uh, stage of that insect species is a maggot, right? And that maggot is <coughs> to this species of blowflies. So if you've ever seen a dead body, you'll see a bunch of flies um, laying their eggs on that dead body. And so by identifying the species of the maggot that's on the victim, we can figure out the, the life cycle of that, uh, of that uh, insect. And that gives us another clue as to how long has that body been there. Edgar, anything yet? Yeah, so we had a few. We had Brian Cole. Um, am I saying it right? Misaela? Misaela? And Daisy? Um, they, so Brian said, it is decomposing with some of the bone showing, but it has a large amount of flesh left. Um, Cole mentioned, um, I think it was more like a question to find out the cause of death. Um, I know Misaela put bodies decay faster in heat. Oh, nice. Um, and Daisy yeah. said the maggots. And Isaiah J just uh, added an important part to understand of these two pages is to find out how long the body has been there. Yep. Yeah. yeah, great job, everybody. Um, you're all correct. I mean, I, I, I can't really uh, point to anything that you said was actually wrong. So um, whoever mentioned large amount of flesh is still remaining, that's absolutely a clue. Um, that means that the body's been there for some amount of time because the skeletal, there's some skeleton uh, that's exposed, but not long enough to, to fully um, show the whole skeleton. So that means that it's, that's a clue for us. That gives us a basic idea of how long it's been there. Um, somebody said the bodies decay faster in the heat, and that is exactly right. Um, the hotter it is, um, the, you know, and, and you guys are, haven't learned chemistry just yet, probably. You might have learned a little bit here and there. Chemical reactions, usually, not always, but um, chemical reactions typically take are faster in, in warmer conditions. And so um, biology, biological activity happens when it's, when it's warm. Now, if it gets too hot, the proteins will degrade and, and cells will rupture and there's other problems. But um, there, there, is a, there is sort of this curve that happens that uh, chemical reactions during warmer uh, temperature will happen faster. Therefore, the body will decompose faster because it's a series of chemical reactions that are taking place. Uh, Daisy mentioned maggots being present. Yes, Daisy's absolutely correct. Maggots being present on the body tells us something. It means that the blowflies had time to come in, lay their eggs. Those eggs took some amount of time to incubate and hatch, and voila, you have maggots. And so the maggots, there's a timeline that it takes for maggots to, to, uh, to be hatched. So excellent job. And Isaiah's right, all of this stuff kind of combined together gives us a better sense of how long that body's been there. And that's gonna become very important here very shortly, okay? All right, uh, so let's keep moving here. Um, so just a question for you. I'm gonna run through some of these. Some of these I'll, I'll emphasize a little more than others. Um, based on what you've read so far, match the following terms, skeleton, insects, cause of death, to the following occupations. Forensic anthropologist, forensic pathologist, forensic entomologist. So in the chat, guys, if you want to take a uh, you know take a take a stab at this, um, uh, of the three careers, which one mostly involves the skeleton? Is it forensic anthropologist, forensic pathologist, or forensic entomologist? And then the same for the other one. So if you guys want to take a you know just pick a pick a uh, a term in green and then match it with a term in brown, um, we can come back to that uh, shortly. All right, so as you're examining the body, a nearby officer notices and comes over. Officer says, hey, what are you, what are you both doing? And remember, it's you being the forensic anthropologist and the forensic pathologist, uh, the entomologist is gonna be coming uh, as well. And so uh, you say, there's, hey, there's five stages of decomposition. Now, decomposition 
is basically where a, an intact body um, is no longer intact. And so uh, the skeleton becomes visible, the tissue starts to sort of degrade, um, insects and scavengers will, will eat um, the, uh, the decaying flesh. I know this is really gross, and apologies, uh, but it's, it's really important that, that uh, you know, you understand this stuff, um, if this is a career choice for you. And so the uh, officer says, well, what are those five stages? And the pathology says, well, different researchers define them in different ways, but in general, they start with freshly deceased and they end with dry decay. And uh, so here are the five stages of decomposition. Now these are important um, because again, depending on which one you classify this body as, uh, will give you a better idea of how to sort of narrow in on that timeline and how long that body's been there. So we have fresh, which is like the body just died, um, bloated, and, and again, going back to the roadkill example, I, you know, sorry for being so gross, but uh, if you have a raccoon that was struck by a car, it's sad because they're, they're cute and fluffy. Um, but uh, what happens is in their guts, um, the bacteria are still working, okay? And as the, uh, as the bacteria continue to pr produce gases as byproducts, you'll see the abdomen of the raccoon begin to bloat. It, it swells up. So you'll see like these raccoon balloons on the side of the road. Um, you feel bad for them, but you're like, oh my gosh, the thing is completely puffed up. Uh, after some amount of time and, and the pressure, um, the skin will rupture and all those gases will escape and that'll put you into active decay stage one, which is the third stage of decomposition. So that flesh caves in, some of the bone becomes exposed, the skin will start to darken, uh, maggots will be present because the blowflies have come in and laid their eggs. Um, very strong odor. You guys have probably smelled this in the past. If you've ever taken like leftover meat, um, like, uh, you know, in my family will we, we get chicken and then we'll kind of uh, cut some of the fat off the chicken before we cook it and then we'll throw the fat in the trash and then a day later you get this horrendous smell from the trash can from all that fat that's decomposing. Uh, that's that same kind of smell but way worse. <laughs> uh, active decay too is the maggots will, they'll actually um, form this, this big maggot mass and they'll move away from the body and they'll pupate. So if you've ever seen the stages of a butterfly where you, you, know, they, uh, have, you have your uh, caterpillar, then there's a cocoon, and then a beautiful butterfly comes out. Um, the same exact process happens with flies and maggots. Uh, the maggot is equivalent to the caterpillar. Um, the pupa is equivalent to the uh, chrysalis or the uh, cocoon for the butterfly. And the fly that comes out would be equivalent to like the butterfly itself. So instead of a beautiful butterfly, it's an annoying fly. <laughs> um, so anyway, so the maggots will leave the body, they'll pupate in this big large mass, more bone will be exposed, the odor will start to dissipate because the flesh is, is basically gone. And then the last stage is the skeleton and, and dry skin remains on the uh, corpse. Okay? So gross stuff, but it, it happens and we can use these events to try to figure out who this person was. So uh, officer says, how are we going to figure out who, um, when the victim died? And so you're telling the officer that we've got to look for something called a PMI, a post-mortem interval. And the PMI is the time that has passed the person has died. So the first thing a pathologist and a forensic anthropologist want to know is how do I get the answer to that question? How do I find out the PMI? That's the, it's the time between a body dying and a body being found, okay? There's, you know, how much ever time that is. Uh, so anyway, the officer shows the, uh, the two scientists working what the uh, missing persons report is. And these are the, uh, the people that have gone missing. I want you to look at this page. And there's information here that's vital uh, to figuring out which one of the four that body may belong to. So uh, Joe Bivon, Cy Walker, John Bolo, or Cal Rissian. Now, if there are any Star Wars fans on here, you may see... Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, our, my team, uh, they're very creative people, and most of them are pictured here. These guys are not really dead. I work with all of these guys at TI, <laughs> um, and they're big Star Wars fans, so they kind of um, did a little hat tip to uh, Star Wars by, uh, by making fake names that sound kind of like Star Wars names. So um, we have a lot of fun at TI, <laughs> as you can see. But besides that, 
take a look at the information. What information is really important for us? And uh, answer in the chat. Uh, I Brad, real quick here, um, Edgar, you guys have any questions, any comments? Up I, actually, I actually posed a question to the group earlier when you're on the which stage of decomposition. Yeah. Um, on that slide, I actually posed to them which stage of decomposition do y'all think the body was found in? The body that was found was in. Um, so I don't know if they, a lot of them were like DK, active DK1, stage three. Um, so would that be, I don't know if you're going to go into that. Yeah, yeah, we're definitely going to go into that. And uh, like these, uh, these students are, are right on the money here. I think they're all paying attention and, and picking up on those clues because absolutely right. We found a de decomposing corpse, um, ages 30 to 50 missing persons. Uh, and then I think here we, we saw that some of the skeletons visible, um, you know, uh, body has a strong odor, odor, maggots are all over the corpse, still a large amount of flesh remaining. And that is pretty close to what we see in active state, active decay one. So uh, well done. Yeah, very good. You, you guys are way ahead of me, which is awesome. I love it. Um, any answers on these, uh, on the, what's the important information on this page yet? on the missing persons page. And then I know uh, um, Jaina, one of the, Jaina, um, I know you mentioned what date is it in the scenario? So July 18th was the date that it was found, I think. Let's see, let's see. Ah, very nice. So, you know, it's funny. Um, you know, I do this activity with teachers a lot and, and teachers are obviously super smart people, but they always miss this. They always miss the date. They look at the text and they identify a lot of important information about the text. Um, so I'm really pleased to hear that uh, some students figured out that, hey, this date, this date's really important, July 18th. That's the day the body was found, right? And we said that PMI, post-mortem interval, is the amount of time between a body dying and a body being found. Well, in order for you to figure out, like, what that timeline is, you have to know both dates or at least a close range of those dates. So whoever that student was, good job. Yeah, very observant. And in forensic science, you have to be very observant. So well done, well done on that. So based on that, if you know that you have to know the, the, uh, the, the find date when you found the body, that means you also need to know the start date of when the body died. And so the closest we have to that is when these people went missing. So these dates are very, very important for that reason. All right. All right, guys. Uh, whoop, and I went a little crazy there. Let me get back here. Okay, so let's see. We, um, uh, let's see. We've got uh, question two here. Uh, what information will be necessary to determine which of the four pers missing persons the body may belong to? Um, I think you guys have already answered that. And for time's sake, I'm going to kind of um, go through this one with you. So average daily temperature and humidity, yes. Uh, you guys answered that one earlier. I um, uh, can't remember her name, but uh, one of the students said that uh, um, the hotter it is, the faster the body will decay, and that's absolutely correct. Uh, current stage of decomposition, you guys just went over that, so, so good job. Uh, and then dates that each person went missing and number of days that have passed, you guys are way ahead. You've already done that as well, so, so perfect job. Uh, page 11, the decomposition rate of a body depends on many factors, including the air temperature. Check all that may also play a role in the rate of decomposition. So uh, humidity, we already acknowledged that uh, how much moisture is in the air is important. Um, the more moisture in the air, the easier it is for the maggots and the blowflies to do what they do. Um, the drier it is, the harder it is for those uh, organisms to, uh, to, to survive. I don't think the sex of the victim has anything to do with this at all. Um, how much skin is exposed, absolutely important, okay? So if we're talking about if the more skin that's exposed to the elements, the weather, predators, flies, um, the more uh, decomposition is going to happen. So if you're all clothed up, if you're you know, buttoned up here and the only thing that's really exposed is, is your face, that's where decomposition will start. Um, but it will take a while before things get down into the rest of the body because the clothes are protecting you from flies and, and uh, predators and those kinds of things. And the presence of scavengers in the area. So what's a scavenger? Uh, well, it's things like coyotes, wolves, um, 
uh, raccoons, um, you know, those kinds of critters that'll come along to try to find a, a free meal. Uh, so as you explain decomposition to the police officer, you pull out your tablet to sort of demonstrate these five stages of decomposition with a simple simulation. And, you know, when we worked with Dr. France on this, uh, some of the original pictures she sent us were pretty gross. Um, not going to lie. She was sending us actual images of victims that she has found and worked with, and we couldn't use those in this activity. <laughs> this activity would have never made it to uh, the light of day. Uh, so what we did instead is we created this real simple simulation. It's not so gross, and um, you kind of get the basic idea. Um, so here it is. You can pick how warm you want the outside air to be with this little clicker, okay? And I think we're, uh, we're, we're going to, let's choose hot. This hot is uh, this red background. Arid means uh, very dry air, um, and human means very uh, moist air. And so we're going to pick humid. So here's the victim. Uh, it's hot, humid. Here's the first day, stage one. And I'm going to let this run for a, a few seconds. You guys will notice uh, the blowflies are the little black dots. The maggots are the little yellow ovals. And odors are represented with these purple squiggly, uh, purple squiggly lines. <laughs> and so uh, we're at day eight. Um, body's been completely consumed. The only thing left is a little bit of uh, skin <clears throat> on a... Uh, on the skeleton. Now I'm going to back that up and I'm going to run it again. We're going to run it at cool this time. We'll do cool and dry. And uh, so before we saw that that body in hot human conditions was completely to stage five by day eight. <clears throat> We're at day 15 and it still hasn't made it all the way to uh, the last stage. So hopefully you guys can see that sort of this illustration is showing you how important temperature and humidity are and how fast things can decay. So um, if we found a body in uh, Alaska in the mountains where it's always cold, it's always icy, versus Louisiana in the bayou where it's always hot and it's always humid, uh, even if both those bodies died at the same time, the one in Alaska would take much, much longer. I mean, we're at day 83 here, right? And before we were at day eight. Um, and we're, we're not even cold, we're cool. If I were to run this as cold, it's gonna take even longer. In fact, I'll just give you the answer for time's sake. It takes about six months. And the reality is this is a simple simulation. It doesn't cover every scenario, it just covers a few. Um, Dr. France found a body in the mountains of Colorado one time that the body was completely intact. Nothing had decayed. Um, the only thing that had happened was the body dehydrated because all the moisture was pulled out of it from the air, but the body itself was mummified. It was completely preserved. Um, and she figured out, based on some other clues in the area, that that body had been there for years. Um, and so uh, it was too cold for scavengers to necessarily um, get a hold of it. It was too cold for the body blowflies to lay eggs and maggots, so no maggots were, were present. You, so you get the idea here, right? I mean, it, it just depends on the other conditions that are, that are associated with it. But the most important is heat and temperature, uh, followed by humidity and then all the other factors that we've talked about. So let's say this body was cold and dry, and um, it looks like it took a really long time um, for that body to uh, uh, to be found. It says 185 days um, before that body went from, from freshly dead, um, stage one, to stage five. That's, that's crazy. So um, that kind of gives you a better idea. Here's another chart that kind of gives you a, um, an understanding of the difference between temperature ranges as well as humidity. So for example, if we're in cold conditions, but it's dry, Ah, we're going to take a lot longer before that body gets to um, uh, stage five, to dry stage. Whereas if you're cold, just as cold, but there's humidity involved, it's a little easier for uh, those flies to still lay eggs and things happen. It's almost cut in half. So humidity is also very important. And you can see this all the way down here. I mean, a hot humid conditions are going to cause a body to decompose much faster than um, hot, uh, dry conditions. Okay. All right. I'm going to pause there, uh, let you guys kind of digest what's happening. Um, any questions or comments so far?
no questions or comments thus far. All right, hopefully everybody uh, isn't getting sick to their stomachs. We're trying to keep this, uh, you know, middle school friendly um, without showing you a lot of gross stuff. Uh, now here's a really neat, um, here's a really neat uh, uh, image. This is an image of that skeleton, but notice the ribs are missing, the cartilage, and the fingers are missing. What happened? What happened here? Did they dissolve away? Was it from scavengers? coyotes or did maggots eat them well maggots can't eat fingers um, very easily it would take a lot of maggots usually blowflies what they'll do is when they land on a freshly dead organism like a, a bird or, or a mammal um, they'll lay their eggs in the soft softest tissue they can find and it, again kind of gross but usually that'll be like the eyes so they'll lay um, their eggs inside the eyes so when the maggots are released, they can eat the soft tissue like the eyelids around the eyes, uh, up in the nostrils, in the mouth, ears, uh, other places that I won't describe here. Um, but they'll lay their, their, their eggs in those places because when the maggots hatch, that tissue is much softer and the, the maggots cannot eat that tissue. Um, usually very muscular areas, it's a little harder uh, for them to do that unless there's been some kind of cut or injury um, in that tissue. Uh, they can't do it. But in this case, with fingers missing and cartilage missing, it's definitely scavengers. So what will happen is a body will die, um, coyotes will come along, and they'll grab a free meal. So they can eat the fingers because they'll fit in the, in the coyote's mouth. Um, they'll, they'll gnaw at the cartilage because that's softer than bone, and there's a little bit of nutrition in there. And they'll also go for the abdomen of, uh, of the person because there's a lot of fat um, stored up in the abdomen, and um, a lot of these scavengers, for us, fat's not as, as um, tasty because we get plenty of it, uh, but if you're a scavenger, fat is like a delicacy. You want to eat a lot of fat because it's got tons of energy stored up in it. So uh, that's, that's uh, definitely on the scavenger side. Okay, all right, so uh, here's a sort of a description of what I was talking about earlier. Uh, the blowflies will lay their eggs in that soft, moist tissue, uh, eyes, nose, mouth, broken flesh. Eggs will hatch in the larvae, which are maggots, will feed on the body tissues, and thousands of maggots will be present on and inside the body. Um, after some time, those maggots will pupate, eventually turning the adult flies uh, during the metamorphosis process. So, uh, so uh, give you a real life story. So Dr. France, every now and then, she'll get a phone call to fly overseas if there's been a plane crash um, to help try to identify the victims, um, especially in like hot, humid areas like Southeast Asia. And she got, she got one of these phone calls one time and she went to um, help try to identify the uh, victims of a plane crash. And um, she said that the, the, the humidity and the temperature were so high that the bodies were in the body bags, but you could see the maggot mass moving the bag itself. Like the inside of the bag itself was moving because the maggot mass was trying to move away from the body to pupate. <clears throat> So if that doesn't turn your stomach, I don't know what will. Um, but anyway, she's the one that gets these calls and has to do this, this work. So it's gross, but it's really important. Because if you didn't have a person like Dr. France, a lot of families would never get the closure of uh, knowing what happened to their loved ones. And so that's why this is very important. When 9-11 happened, she got that phone call. She had to go to uh, the wreckage and try to help identify um, victims of 9-11. Uh, of so uh, she's done a lot of amazing work. You guys, you know, if you get time to Google her, uh, her name is Dr. Diane France. Um, really, really fascinating uh, person. She's got a heart of gold too. She really takes this work seriously to try to help families uh, get past, you know, um, or finding out what happened to the loved ones. All right. So uh, this one's more of a, it's a question, but it's, it's really more of a sort of a concept. So because the blowfly life cycle, again, egg, larvae, pupa, adult, uh, is so consistent with the various decomposition stages of a human, it's a reliable data source for investigators to determine post-mortem interval, interval of the disease. And so if we know that the maggots have pupated and they've moved away, that gives us a time estimate of how long that body may have been there. That's where that forensic entomologist comes into play. 
All right, so uh, blowflies tend to lay their eggs in the eyes, nostrils, mouth, and open wounds of dead bodies. Why is this? Uh, we've answered that question because of the soft, moist tissue. Okay. Uh, so occasionally incredibly well-preserved mummified remains of mammals, such as mammoths or humans, are found in areas that have varying temperatures. How is it possible that you can find mummified animals or humans in hot or warm climates? Well, the answer is it's because those hot and warm climates are dry. Um, human areas, those things would not last. But in dry areas, and I'm talking like the, the cold mountain example I gave you earlier, all the way to like a desert. So think about being in, um, a, you know, the uh, uh, Death Valley, and, you know, California desert, and um, you find uh, human remains. Um, there may be some scavenging, scavenging that takes place, but there are no flies or, or uh, maggots that can sustain that uh, kind of arid, that dryness. They have to have some level of moisture. So what happens is the body very quickly shrivels up, it, it dehydrates, and it gets preserved that way. It basically turns into a mummy because of the uh, desert dry conditions. All right, so here we go. We're on the, on the process here of trying to figure out who that body belongs to. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to this animation. Now, we said that it was warm, and humid, if I'm not mistaken. And let's double check that. Uh, let's see, we said, I think it's in this page. Uh, sweat forms on your brow has uh, been warm and humid all summer. So there's your clue. <laughs> Told you there are clues in these things. Um, so we're gonna choose that and I'm gonna let this run. And this should, you know, uh, simulate what happened to the body, how long it's been there. You guys said it was at this stage when it was found, right? But I'll let this run through um, to the end. So stage four. Eric, do you mind pausing it really quick? I wanna pose a question yeah. to the students. Absolutely. How long do y'all think, how many days do you think it'll be um, until, I mean, everything, it goes through its cycle? Does anyone want to, do y'all want to have some predictions? I see Isaiah put 20, 20 to 21, Brian, Luis, 23, Ekamavir, 23, Ryan, 20 to 21, Layla, 20 to 24, okay. Predictions are getting larger and larger. Yeah. Any others? I'm going to give y'all 10 seconds and then let's see a... Uh, and then we'll play it again. You guys are basically doing what a forensic anthropologist does. You're taking your best guess with the limited information you have available um, and giving yourself a little bit of a range. And so that's exactly what Dr. France does. Man, I see some high twin high like high twenties now, thirties. Okay. <laughs> so we went from the twenties to thirties. All right. Well, Eric, let's uh let's see. You gonna finish it up? Yeah. Okay, let's see what happens here. Yeah, so we go a few days uh, past the skeletal stage, but uh, because of the range we talked about, um, but it looks like, uh, yeah, day 27, everything's pretty much done. What exists at day 27 will continue to exist, if that makes sense. So there's no more flesh that's really um, uh, edible and uh, you know, the scavengers have done their, what they do with the cartilage. You notice the fingers have all been gnawed off. Um, the skeleton will, will, will just stay out in the wilderness until someone finds it one day. So it looks like day 27. So the range would be, um, so about 6.3 days at stage four before it made it to stage five. Uh, so, so very good. Um, and that's important, guys. So, so here's the deal. We said or somebody, one of you said that the body was found at stage three, which was the active decay one stage. It's a little confusing the way they number it. So active decay one, and that was stage three. Okay, so here's stage three here, and there's 7.2 days that the body was in stage three, 2.7 days before that, 1.8 days before that. So let's do some quick math. Um, so if I take 7.2, add 2.7 and 1.8, you guys are probably faster at this than I am. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. We got a 
11.7 days. Is that what everybody else is getting? About 12 days. Yep. Um, and that was when it was in stage three, which is when the body was found. So that means that the body's likely been there up to up to 12 days. Does that make sense? All right. Um, <clears throat> so let's see. So here's the deal. Uh, so based on that, um, we know 12 days, and we know when the body was found was July 18th. Okay, so July 18th, that's important. We, we acknowledge that that was important. Uh, we said about 12 days that the body's probably been there. So from all of this data, we can sort of extrapolate back to one of these guys. Who, and I'm not going to give the answer. I want you guys to, to try to figure this out. Which of these four guys does a body possibly belong to? Because it could belong to somebody that's not even on this page right here. We don't know. We're just limiting down the options. So who's the possible, um, who, who does a body possibly belong to? And who can it absolutely not belong to? Because we know that the, the math doesn't make sense. I'll give you guys a few seconds to, to think about that and try to come up with a conclusion. <clears throat> so I asked them to answer who can it belong to first. Sure. Um, so I see a lot of B's and A's. B's, of B's and A's. A's. Okay. Okay. Who can it not belong to? I thought who can it not belong to? Hmm. Uh, a lot of C's and D's. Okay, yeah, C's and D's. They're not belonging to, yep. Let's explore this. So we said about 12 days max. So it's sometime before, it's 12 days or before, right? It's, it's maybe like, let's say seven to 12 days. Because remember each stage had a number of days. All right, and we said stage three. Um, stage three had uh, 7.2 days. So there's some uh, variation there, right? So we can say 12 days minus 7.2, we'll just call it seven. So it could be actually anywhere between five days to 12 days, okay? So we need to find which one of these guys went missing five to 12 days before the body was found. Body was found on July 18th. So 12 days before July 18th would be July, um, uh, July 2nd. Is that, is that right? No, no, July uh, 6th. And then we said um, 12 days, that's 12 days. And then we said five days before would be July uh, 13th. Okay. So whichever one of these guys went missing between July 6th to July 13th, is likely the person the body would belong to. And I, you said there were a lot of Bs, and B is the correct answer, Cy Walker. <laughs> Cy Walker is who the body belongs to. And you guys, hopefully you, you see how we sort of deducted all of this uh, information into a logical conclusion. The reason it can't be Joe Fine, and actually that's not true, it could be, it could be any of these guys, honestly. Think about it. Just because one, somebody went missing before doesn't mean they died on that same day. So you could make an argument that says, yeah, okay, John Bolo went missing May 17th, but what if he didn't die until, you know, uh, July 5th or July 6th? Yeah, it's true. Okay, so what would you do? So the best we can do is say, okay, well, the most likely body uh, per, uh, uh, person the corpse belongs to is Cy Walker based on when he went missing, Okay. Um, just because, you know, we went missing around that same time. Of course, no good story comes without a, uh, a conclusion. And uh, in this conclusion, we said, hey, congratulations. You did find out that um, it was Cy Walker. Uh, there was no wrongdoing here, just that he was out on a walk. Um, he tripped and uh, landed on a large rock. Um, exposed root was near his feet. So you infer that Cy Walker was on a hike outside the city, uh, hit his head, died at the scene. Forensic pathologist agrees with your assessment. Sad as the situation may be, your work as a forensic anthropologist helps us uh, helps this family 
put their loved ones to rest. All right, so uh, um, sort of a nice, neat package we wrapped this up in for you. Um, in reality, it's probably not so nice and neat, you know, in terms of uh, the data. Sometimes it is, it isn't. Um, some people, you know, remain missing for a long time and, and you know, investigators do what they can. But uh, when you find a body, you try to use everything you can around that body to figure out who it belongs to so you can uh, uh, provide some closure to the family. All right, so um, uh, great uh, input from everybody. It sounds like you guys are, are on your way to careers in forensic anthropology or forensic science. Um, I hope that's this uh, got you thinking about that as a possible career. Um, in this particular activity, there are a bunch of extensions that we get into. We won't talk about those too much today, um, but we get into other aspects of it, like uh, total body score, which forensic pathologists use to say, okay, the head looks like it's at stage three, but the arm looks like it's at stage two. So it's not just um, the body's at one complete stage. You can actually look at different areas of the body. Sometimes you might find a body partially buried in the ground. Well, the ground actually helps preserve that part of the body versus the part that's, that's out in the air. And so you use all of these clues to get to that whole uh, PMI thing, which is post-mortem interval. Um, so anyway, uh, this activity is free online. You guys can download it. The software currently is free to download too if you wanted to download the teacher premium software. So teachers or students, you guys are all welcome. Just go to education.ti.com and you'll see a prompt for uh, COVID-19 resources and then you can download all of this stuff for free. Yeah. Edgar, um, I'm out of time, but uh, I, I still have a couple minutes if anybody has any questions or um, uh, comments or, or any uh, discussion points you want to bring up. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, if you have anything, please feel free to share. Um, I know we're at the time. Um, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. You can always ask the teachers. The teachers can send them to me, and then I can also share them with Eric. Yeah, absolutely, and I'll get right back to you. Yeah, um, I don't see anything in the chat thus far. Um, I'll give you, like, another... We just have thank yous. Um, if everyone can please give Eric a thank you, uh, I would say a large round of applause, but uh, <laughs> this yeah. virtual space, maybe y'all can do like the clap, the clap feature, whatever it may be. But thank you all for your input, for your engagement. It was great, it was amazing. Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks everybody. Really appreciate the, uh, uh, the attention. Hope you enjoyed this. I do apologize, this is right before your lunch times, uh, most likely, but uh, hopefully it won't affect you too much, um, and hopefully you enjoyed it. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, uh, I do want to let y'all know that once you log off of here, you're going to leave this meeting and then go to your class meeting. So make sure you log off of this one, um, and then go into your class one. They're two different links. All right, everybody, have a great day, and, and next time. That's so cool. This one was uh this one was nice. Yeah. I, mean, I like yesterday's. Uh this one's cool because it has like the, the questions. Yeah. The little like the multiple choice. Yeah, I like that too.